me now introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, Professor Pepaolo Porzonetti, another prominent scholar of Tartini, um, who has devoted already a lot of attention to Tartini studies and to this subject. And I'm really happy to have him today. And I'm eager to hear what he will say today. Please. May I, may I begin? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I will. I. I. I'm going to share uh, the screen. Here we go. And you can move. Uh, you can move my face around if I if you see that is covering text that you need to read. Um, oh wait, um, I actually need to make sure that the audio is right. I'm going to do it again. Apologize. Okay. Can you see the screen? Okay. Um, so I will begin by thanking uh, Nate, uh, Suklian, and all the others organizers uh, of this conference and, and participants as well for your heroic effort to make this happen under the present circumstances. And I want also to express my gratitude to the Italian colleagues uh, who organized and participated last month in the Tartini conference, especially Margherita Canale for her feedback to my contribution, which helped me to expand it into the present keynote presentation. A special thank you to Sergio Durante for suggesting first the topic of this ongoing research project and for exchanging with me many ideas and information about it. Let us start by listening to two short ex excerpts from two cantabile movements, one by Bach and one by Tartini, approximately uh, written at the same time between 1735 and the early 1740s. First, we will hear um, a fragment for, from the first movement of Bach's G minor sonata for violin. <laughs> listen to Tartini as Andante Cantabile from his E minor sonata number six from the manuscript 1888. two slow cantabile movements in search of similarities and differences would be an amusing but dangerous game. The reason 
is that comparative analysis inevitably bears value judgments and teleological implications, such as the notion of originality and imitation, influence, tradition, and progress. The danger is that this heavy load could prevent us from discovering the true nature of the relationship between Bach and Tartini. Discovering the nature of that relationship requires us to float lightly across the canals of a complex network where we need to be on the lookout for indirect links rather than direct comparisons. I will only make one observation. It is obvious to me, but it is obvious to the eye and not to the ear, that Tartini's autograph manuscript presents an encoded poetical motto, Senti lo mare, and Tommaso Luison uh, spoke about these mottos earlier. Uh, the use of poetical mottos, which also Sergio Durante has studied in depth, is a distinctive characteristic of Tartini's compositional practice, which never ceases to intrigue and surprise Tartini scholars and performers like uh, Kerr Gottbild, probably you um, provided an example of that. This particular cryptographed motto, unless I missed something, has not been identified. Please correct me if I'm wrong later. It is possible that in this case, as in other instances, Tartini annotated an incipit of a poetical line, perhaps I like to believe from a folk song and used it for musical and poetical inspiration to either or both composition and performance. And it also would work in line with what Tommaso was saying, if you sing it, if you sing it uh, with the uh, melodic line. Bach practiced cryptography too. His cryptographies, however, are musical rather than verbal, as in the case of the canons written on the regal theme composed by Frederick II, King of Prussia, to whom Bach dedicated his musical offering. In this case, a canon can crescent or crab canon. At the end of the piece, if you move the, some of the faces, you will see that at the very end, um, Bach inserts a second clef with three flats for the key of C minor upside down, um, providing the clue for the solution of the canonic riddle, the prime subjects notated normally from uh, left to right, need to be played together with its retrograde, which is the prime from the last to the first note. <laughs> Tartini, notwithstanding his interest in mathematics, had no interest in the invention of ingenious contrapuntal devices of this kind, preferring instead poetical inspiration or musical sentimentality and the theater of feelings, to paraphrase an essay by Ivano Cavallini on the philosophy of music of Giarinaldo Carli, Tartini's friend from Copper, musica sentimentale e teatro della commozione. Let us start with considering what separates Bach and Tartini. Bach was perceived as the master of invention and art. 
Tartini as the master of expression and nature. There was a prodigious distance separating two con these two contemporary musicians. Bach lived in Lutheran cities like Leipzig, 1,000 kilometers from Catholic Padua, where Tartini spent most of his life and career. Bach's library in Leipzig included an extensive repertory of Italian composers, including Frescobaldi, Albinoni, Bassani, Corelli, Lotti, Stefani, Vivaldi, Pergolesi, Locatelli, Legrenzi, Torelli, Caldara, and Francesco Durante. Yet, according to Christian Weiswenger's Johann Sebastian Bach's Noten Bibliothek, there was no composition by Tartini on Bach's shelves. When I attended the Stanford Conference on Bach and Mozart in the pre-COVID world, which was last February, feels like a long time ago, Eleanor Selfridge Field presented her new findings on Bach's transcription for keyboard, confirming his Bach's interest for Italian composers of instrumental concertos, such as Vivaldi, Alessandro and Benedetto Marcello, showing his predilection, though, for the modern solo concerto over the more antiquated concerto grosso. Among the musicians transcribed by Bach, Tartini again is missing. We know that Bach, in his concertos for the Zimmermann Coffee House in Leipzig, where he directed the Collegium Musicum, often programmed music by Italian composers such as Locatelli, Porpora and Alessandro Scarlatti. Here too, there is no evidence that Tartini was ever performed. In this case, though, I have to say the evidence is very scarce. Similarly, we have no hard evidence that Bach's music ever reached Tartini's ears. For these reasons, hearing Bach and Tartini in the same context might seem a bold pairing to uh, at least a purist music historian. Even though we are used to such pairings in the uh, concert halls or in the palimpsest of radio programs, not to speak of streaming platforms. Paul Valéry, in an iconic and iconoclastic essay published in 1924, denounced what in the title itself he calls the Le Problème de Musée describing the surreal experience of the coexistence in the same space of objects belonging to different and often incompatible, incompatible contexts, clashing against each other even more when they seem similar and comparable. C'est un paradoxe que les rapprochements des Marseillais indépendantes mais adverses et même qui sont les plus ennemis l'un de l'autre quand elles se ressemblent les plus. Une civilisation ni voluptueuse ni raisonnable peut seule avoir édifié cette maison de l'incohérence. Valéry compares then the museum hall to an imaginary cacophony of ten orchestras playing different pieces of music simultaneously, dix orchestres à la fois. Sorry about that. I, it was really, really clashing the key. So, after considering discord and separation, let's revert to concord or what brings Bach and Tartini together. The links between Bach and Tartini, in fact, do exist, but they are not as direct as we may hope for. In the relationship Bach-Tartini, there is no influence, no imitation, no reaction or open rejection, which, which saves us from the risk of falling in the trap of aesthetic Darwinism, typical of many music history narratives, with their arsenal of dichotomies, such as center, periphery, global history, local history, 
originality and imitation. In order to understand the network linking back to Tartini, it is useful to adopt and adapt the theory or rather method of sociological research called actor network theory and first developed in Paris by the Centre de la Sociologie de l'Innovation. Bruno, Bruno Latour illustrates how the network is an interconnected system binding objects. In our case, this, the objects could be musical instruments, written music, uh, including pedagogical material and so on. Uh, people like students and musicians, uh, or even listeners, and places that may appear disconnected at first. In so doing, the actor network theory overcomes what Latour calls the tyranny of distance. The notion of container visualized either as a two-dimension surface or a three-dimension object are replaced by the notion of a web of lines visualized as a network of filiform connectors called actors. This could be a little uh, disorienting if you're not familiar with the theory because actors are not actually the people. They could be anything that establishes a connection. The actors are the connecting forces. They can be human or non-human. They are not static entity, but dynamic. Uh, forces in flux, moving objects and people creating opportunities for encounters that solidify or decay over time. As Latour warns us, actors do not stand still for long enough to take a group photo. Boxes overlap, arrows get twisted and torn. Bach and Tartini are not looking for each other and do not find each other. The network does it for them. A group of important actors are the students of both Bach, including his many children, and Tartini. Both artists were indeed committed teachers and their students, after completing their training, traveled and relocated elsewhere. Their music was not solely indebted to their primary teacher as they fused different orientations and styles together. For example, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's 18th, one eight, no, 18th uh, child, Johann Christian Bach in 17, 55, when, he, when, when uh, Johann Christian Bach was only 20 years old, after studying with his father, wrote a, con a concerto nach Tartini's manier, in the style of Tartini. This is cataloged as the concerto C74 in the thematic catalog by Wer uh, Werberton, who supposes that there is, he says, one remote possibility that it could also be the concerto in E major, C and C six, based on the date and style, probably in the adagio you can see some uh, Tartinian uh, style there. And a little bit of fantasy. The only information we have about this concerto is in the inventory uh, of CPE back, uh, it's at the far right of the slide. Um, uh, his, uh, who was Johann Christian's brother, old, uh, older brother, nine years older, uh, which led the violinist and musicologist Boris Schwartz to imagine that Johann Christian wrote it under the guidance of uh, his brother, adding an additional possible connection in the uh, roadmap of our network. 
it is possible that some transcriptions of Tartini's concertos circulated among Bach students as pedagogical material, even though this material was not in Bach's personal library. This would be the case of the keyboard transcriptions of uh, Tartini's concertos uh, by Leonard Frischmuth, this one included in the anthology keyboard transcriptions from the back circle edited by Russell Stinson. Leipzig, where Bach taught, could be a knot for the convergence of both objects and people. Jane Stevens and George Stauffer agree that there was a robust presence of Tartini's works in the booming book market of this university town. For this reason, Stevens thinks that it is not by chance that we can detect formal and stylist similarities between Tartini's Opus 1, Les 1728, and many concertos by J.S. Bach and Sons. And she spends many pages in her book to analyze this stylistic similarities. Estelle Joubert and Christoph Wolf have insisted how J.S. Bach owed most of his reputation to his students and family, including family. In Leipzig, most of his students were enrolled in the university and in the school of St. Thomas. Many of them played or sang in the Collegium Musicum directed by Bach at the Zimmermann Coffee House, participating as it was customary in 18th century coffee culture in caffeinated discussions about music and ideas. These animated exchanges were carried on orally and left no visible footprints in, on the map of our network. As for Tartini, the Maestro delle Nazioni, it is well known that um, it is well known how his international students disseminated his ideas about theory and aesthetic of music widely. Pedagogically, Tartini was open to music of different aesthetical orientation, spanning from music of oral tradition or popular music. Um, to, uh, uh, to the repertory of written art music, like Counterpoint. And this is an interesting manuscript. I thank Guido Viverit for sharing it with me. The manuscript is from Dresden, uh, was wrongly attributed to Geminiani. Um, and um, and it's an interesting case of how Tartini used the two voice counterpoint for teaching both composition and performance, phrasing and the discipline of listening carefully to each other. This piece is an example of a 16 note fugato that seemed to adhere to the didactic model that Tartini hands to his student Maddalena Lombardini Sirmen when he writes to her, sarà ottima cosa che suoni ogni giorno qualche fuga di corelli tutta di semicroni. So play every day as a medicine almost, um, 16th note fugue by Corelli. Um, Protestant students of Tartini show how the network was able to overcome political and ideological barriers. When Tartini's pupil Bernard Chef converted to Catholicism, Tartini wrote, um, Tartini, uh, here we are, um, wrote uh, to the secretary of Count Valdec, the student sponsor, explaining that as a matter of professional ethics, he never talks about religion with his students. And he writes, I had many Protestant students, Tartini writes in this letter, Saxons, Prussians, Hollanders, and Englishmen. Uh, 
Stuttgart and Munich could be also interesting notes for the study of students of both Tartini and Bach. Here, they might have converged and crossed paths, but further, further research is needed to study this aspect. Many of Tartini's German students came from Dresden, a city where Protestant and Catholic cultures uh, coexisted. There is an, an interesting book about uh, this by Mary Frenzen, Crossing Confessional Boundaries, the Patronage of Italian Sacred Music in uh, 17th century Dresden, but I think that culture extended to the 18th century. Johann uh, Gottlieb Naumann was one of Tartini's Protestant students from Dresden, and in Dresden Naumann studied Bach's music. So this is the connection, before joining Tartini School in Padua. Uh, Neumann in his memoirs remembers how Tartini's teaching were not only about performance practice and composition, but also about scientific and philosophical notions reflected in Tartini's treatises like Trattato di Musica or La Scienza Moderna Fondata sul Cerchio, with his distinctive fusion of modern science rooted in the uh, Galilean tradition and Neoplatonic and religious mysticism at a crossroad between the studio of Padua, the university where Galileo taught, and the Basilica of St. Anthony. Foundational to Tartini's music theory and pedagogy was, as we know, his discovery of the third sound based on the empirical observation of an acoustic phenomenon, which Tartini explained in mathematical and geometrical terms, following Galileo's idea that the book of nature is written in mathematical language. For Tartini, the third sound corresponded to a Copernican revolution, as it is grounded, it is um, as it grounded the harmonic system on the higher pitches generating the bass, rather than the other way around. So you have two high pitches and the di difference. Uh, in modern time, we calculate the difference of frequencies. Tartini didn't use that system, but the difference between the higher pitches generate the base. Uh, contrary to Tartini, Rameau grounded the harmony on the base, generating higher pitches, the harmonics that form the chords. Rousseau preferred Tartini's system, presenting it as a natural antidote to Rameau's artificial harmonic theory. Even though Rameau and Tartini never met. Their differences brought them to the arena of a typical 18th century querel on the basis of the natural foundation of harmony on the third sound. In the Trattato di Musica, Tartini shows diffidence towards artful tuning systems that allow to explore modulations to distant keys. In fact, he was diffident of modulation in general, detecting in it the foul smell of nature corrupted by art. Bach, on the other hand, did not hesitate to adapt what we may call genetically modified tuning systems, allowing him to explore and exploit every major and minor key. The 18th century binary opposition of nature versus art risks to pull Bach and Tartini apart, but it is precisely this difference that brought them together. First, both grounded their, their understanding of music and science. In Leipzig, a university city like Padua, Bach was able, uh, was perceived and described as the Newton of music, hence a pursuer of true knowledge grounded in the observation of nature 
and its mathematical conceptualization. The critic Christian Friedrich Daniel Schubert wrote in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung in 1801, a little late, that Bach embraced and understood the study of harmony with a Newtonian spirit. Second, both Bach and Tartini fused science and mysticism. For Bach, like for Newton, creation leads to the creator, to God. Third, the entrenchment of art and nature in 18th century discourse needed champions to feed the passion of intellectual discourse. In this climate, what separates Bach and Tartini is what brings them together in the imaginary and peaceful boxing ring. As in the case of Rameau versus Tartini match, Rousseau and his followers were always eager to stir up the fight. While Rousseau saw in Tartini the champion of nature in music, the Rousseauian critic Adolf Scheibe accused Bach of ignoring the laws of nature, composing music polluted by art. In 1737, a professor of the University of Leipzig, Johann Avram Brindbaum, defended his friend Johann Sebastian Bach from these accusations by explaining that Bach never intended to imitate nature, but rather to perfect it, reaching true musical perfection, which is not available in nature and which is accessible only to the connoisseurs of art. This is the episode that knighted Bach as the champion of art. And we come full circle. 10 years later, Friedrich II of Prussia, great sponsors, as we, as we know, of music and philosophy, invited Johann Sebastian Bach to his court. This famous event brings us back to the musical offering. Bach's homage to the king, from which we have already considered the Crab Canon. The old collection is an eclectic anthology of fugues, canons, and a gallant trio sonata for violin and flute, the instrument that the king played. The collection became famous for its artful uh, contrapuntal inventions even though Bach tried to reflect Friedrich's taste for variety, um, a variety of different uh, styles and orientations. Such a curiosity for difference as an openness of taste was clear from the musicians that the king hired and invited to his court, which allows me to make some further progress in the roadmap of our network. It's a full picture, can be a little confusing. Among the musicians at the Berlin court, we find the Graun brothers. The elder, the concert master Johann Gottlieb Graun, studied with Tartini, as Johann Georg Pisendel, a friend of J.S. Bach, brought to Telemann. Graun probably studied with Tartini in Dresden in 1723 or 24, and or in Prague in 1723, less likely in Padua. He became then the tutor of, um, of Wilhelm Friedman Bach in 1726. Wilhelm Friedman worked in Dresden for 12 years, starting in 1736. Some students of Tartini active in Dresden, such as Anton Lenheis, Johann Heinrich Eiselt, and Johann Baptist Hund, could have come in contact with Bach's son and other musicians in immediate network. The relations and links between Dresden and Tartini's network is pervasive, gravitating around his students, but also violins that were sent there, 
And uh, also thanks to what I would call a super actor, which is Francesco Algarotti, who was a catalyst in exchange of relations between uh, Padua, uh, Dresden, and Berlin. The author of his best selling Newtonanesimo per le dame um, also links us to, as, as Sergio was reminding me, to Newton. Another musician at the Berlin court was uh, Franz Denda, who in 1749 wrote to Telemann expressing his great admiration for Tartini. Herrn Tartini, welcher ich sehr auch schätze, and telling him that many musicians there would like to acquire what he calls Tartinischen Solis, perhaps intending the piccole sonate. Um, as a result of the presence of Tartini's music and uh, reputation in Berlin, Friedrich II sent to Tartini a theme as he did for Bach, hoping he could elaborate it into a larger composition or set of compositions. And as Sergio Durante pointed out earlier today in his keynote presentation, Fanzago in his eulogy for the memorial service for Tartini's death reports that Tartini sent to the Prussian king a concerto based on the royal theme of which we have no other piece of information. We know that in 1749, Tartini wrote a letter to Algarotti in Berlin, who was in Berlin at the time, and was a, a close friend of Friedrich II, accompanying some of his works to be submitted to the attention of the king. And he writes, dal di lei comando, sono obbligato, I'm obliged, mandar costa to send here le mie composizioni all'esame e giudizio di cotesto monarca, to be submitted to the examen and judgment of this monarch. Tartini warns Tartini, Tartini warns Algarotti that only a musician with a compatible personality and expression could perform his piece convincingly, defining his character and expression as more at home with nature than with art. Perché si sappia il mio carattere la mia e la mia intenzione, devo dire che io sto di casa più che posso con la natura, meno che posso con l'arte. It sounds like an allusion to his difference with Johann Sebastian Bach, the champion of art, who only two years, only two years earlier, sent his own musical offering to the king as a manifesto of the superiority of art over nature. Bach's and Tartini's paths crossed in Berlin because they were complementary artists in a musical ecosystem that needed them both. To conclude, let us have a look at this strange mid 18th century engraving recently published in Sergio's book, Tartini, Padova, l'Europa. The print shows an imaginary concert with Juans, who was at the court of Friedrich, and brought his book on flute player inspired very much by Tartini's Regole, he quotes the Tartini's Regole. Uh, it was also Friedrich's Tudor. <clears throat> Handel at the... Uh, Handel, play, who was in, in London. Uh, Tartini, at the violin, and two children, the young Gluck and Jomelli. Looking for direct connections among these musicians active in different locations would be superfluous, perhaps. They were never together in a real space, yet they inhabited the same space in the collective imagination, a, a concert hall without walls, built not with bricks, but with the continual flux of ideas, musicians, musics, instruments, texts in the shared network. 
once we become aware of that network, listening to these musicians playing together makes sense, has meaning, and produces value. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Kvala Lepa. Okay, thank you very much to Paolo Polzonetti for this second keynote speech. Do we have any questions, comments, ideas, thoughts? Um, I have a question. Who was the author of the Crossing Confessional Boundaries? Um, you mentioned the, the author book. is, uh, let me write it, <clears throat> Mary Franzen. Oh, okay, thank you. So I checked Google and I got a result that John Renner wrote a book called by the same name. Ah. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> I hope there's not a case of plagiarism. Okay, any other questions? I see a question by Ugo Poli asking me about uh, level Mozart and the network. And this is something that my Maestro Pierluigi Petrobelli often insisted on. It's, um, it's what at first created possibly a lot of interest in Tartini when there was very little, because Leopold Mozart, like Quanz in his violin schule, um, in this case, plagiarizes Tartini and could have possibly um, uh, could have no, uh, for sure taught some of those ideas to his son uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So we have a different network. And that would be interesting to include, and I think, thank you, Hugo, because it would be really interesting to include Mozart, um, who studied Bach very carefully as part of that indirect network if we extend it beyond the time frame of uh, Tartini's life. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Roberta, please. Yeah, many thanks for your paper. Um, I have a couple of questions because it uh, um, does not uh, clear to me which uh, time lapse are you referring to because on one hand uh, if you refer to the relations between Padua, Venice maybe and Dresden I uh, ask myself um, where is uh, Johann David Einichen for example and on the other hand when you refer to this relation or dichotomy I should say nature and art it's quite narrow because on the one hand we have references to uh, Galileo in Tartini at different stages, just for example in the Dissertazione or uh, in the letters to Riccati uh, um, in the matter of the coincidence theory, and there are different positions. On the other hand, you should maybe consider also uh, Bach in relation to the Correspondivende Societate meets the Hamburg because you mentioned Scheibe, and then we have the U matter uh, uh, concerning the enharmonic genre. In that relation, then is uh, more as a <laughs> Bach more natural than other German colleagues. Yeah, so, thank you. I mean, the, as for the time frame, when we talk about the students, there is uh, the need to be flexible. So we think of a narrow time frame, which is when the students encounter the maestro, the teacher, and the network then continues as the students relocate and have their own students and so on. As for Galileo, I think that uh, there is some, possibly some 
um, misunderstanding and it would take, uh, but it, in simple terms, both Bach and Tartini are indebted to modern science in two different aspects. So Tartini is very much indebted to Galileo. You are right, uh, Roberta uh, quotes him, but also he inserts, I mean, it's very clear that his method is Galilean. And uh, less clear is the connection between Bach and Newton, who is the Galileo of, uh, the equivalent of Galileo for Bach but people recognized it very much. So in this case, we have a, a similar approach. Both were seen as sort of modern scientists, but both were also mystics because we like to, here it comes to what Sergio earlier defined, the dark side of the enlightenment. It is a Marxist misunderstanding that the Enlightenment's passion for science was anti-religious or against superstition. In fact, it was very much based on the uh, drive to find God in nature through the study of uh, uncorruptible mathematical and geometrical ideas as in Plato. Okay, thank you. More questions? Comments? Huh? Professor Zasla? Yes. Hello, Pierre Paolo. <coughs> This is really addressed to the luxury of having all these uh, Tartini experts in one room, so to speak. Um, what is the evidence that enables you to say over and over again that Tartini discovered the third sound? Because as I imagine you all know, organ builders knew all about that long before Tartini came on it. Now, I, I do understand um, that because I was a professional flutist, <laughs> we discovered the third sound on our own uh, as children because when you play duets, high duets in thirds, you have a third sound in the room, especially if there's a low ceiling. So maybe musicians knew about it for a long time without putting it to the particular end very brilliant use that Tartini put it, but I, I wondered what um, uh, what evidence there is that uh, he made the theory for the first time. Yeah, thank you. This is a very very good question. I uh, I love this question because it's almost like saying that. Uh, Newton discovered gravity, you know, like if you, <laughs> people before Newton didn't know that falling uh, on the ground would hurt. You know? <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. I mean, it, this is something that is, it was always there. And, uh, and, and what Tartini, like Newton, basically discovered the, um, the law of the, th the third sound. So it would be more precise to say, that uh, he was the first to make public a discovery that uh, made public the mathematical conceptualization of a phenomenon that was well known. In the narrative of this, though, we have the um, Tartini telling us that he actually, in Ancona, uh, in the precise date, you know, uh, uh, 1713 or 14, um, was uh, like St. Paul on the, on the road to Damasco, 
uh, was stricken by this light and and was and it was really like a moment of revelation the secrets of nature were revealed to him and, he, and he, there are uh, religious overtones about this like it's, it's a sort of messiah of a new um, path that is going to discover between the physical world and the metaphysical world but you're right, he didn't discover the third time. <laughs> I, uh, I love your answer. This suggests that um, uh, you correctly said, as far as I know, that he was the first person to systematically publish uh, an explanation. Um, yeah. But this suggests that we should be looking in the private papers and oral traditions and training of organ builders who knew exactly how to take two small pipes and baffle them to get a low note in organs where they didn't have the money for large pipes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so they had, it, they had it under control uh, pragmatically and maybe even theoretically, but it was a trade secret. Yeah, the, it, this is very much about um, this is very much about uh, publicity and self promotion in terms of um, um, the presence, and Sergio was talking about this, the Tartini wants to be accepted, not as a simple musician, but as a natural scientist, as somebody who uh, is bringing music to the next level, which is not the organ builders, the violin builders, the musicians, those are artisans that might know the trade like uh, alchemists might know secrets about chemistry but this is about disseminating ideas to and putting these ideas to the attention of academicians of the mathematical world of the other scientists who would uh, peer review the ideas and, and if if there is any truth in it Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? <clears throat> we have a few more minutes. Can take some more questions. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let me conclude this <clears throat> second keynote speech. Um, thanks again to Pierpaolo Polzonetti.